Okay, let's try to calculate how much ripple do I have. So this is the circuit that I was discussing, and this was the behavior um, that we saw uh, for the circuit, for the V out of the circuit versus V in, right? So if I want to write the um, expression for V out only from this point at the peak that the discharge starts all the way to this point, right? And we said we call this T3 and this point Let's call it uh, basically T peak, right? So what does happen? I can say that this is, as I said, this is a natural response of an RC circuit. So I know that the natural response of an RC circuit is going to be the V naught, the initial voltage, e to the power of negative T over tau. And since this is an RC, this is going to be V naught, e to the power of negative T over RC. Okay, so V out. It's going to be V out at, uh, at time zero or at the time that this charge starts times e to the power of negative t over rc. So looking at this equation, that's what I wrote here. So this is the V out at t equal to zero at the start at the t peak at the start of this charge. So V peak being like, for example, 5 volts, V D on was 0 0.7. So this is really 4.3, right? So we start at 4.3 and we're going to discharge like this. OK, now if I choose my R and C, mostly C, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, why I cannot really choose R, right? If I choose C in a way that it is big enough that this fraction is actually pretty small, the T over RC is very small, then I can use this uh, basically property that the exponential of X is approximately 1 minus x if x is actually much smaller than 1. So if we are really dealing with an epsilon kind of a stuff, meaning epsilon level or scale kind of numbers, if the numbers are very small, you can actually approximate e to the power of that number with 1 minus that number. Okay, And that's what we do here. So going from the first line to the second line, all I did is that I replaced e to the power of negative t over rc with 1 minus t over rc. Mainly, basically, intuitively, if I actually look at this, what I'm trying to say is that if this discharge is slow enough, so I could have a discharge like this, or like this, or like, like a very, very slow discharge, right? All I'm saying is that if the discharge is slow enough, that basically... I do a cycle and I come back and after I come back, I, I only had discharged this basically from this peak point to a little bit less than that peak point. I can approximate this behavior here as a as a linear kind of a behavior, right? And you can see it why. Like it looks it but for a very, very slow discharge, this V out in this section that is discharging, it really looks like a line, right? And that's what we are doing here in, the, in our calculations. We are saying that if the if we make sure that this fraction fraction is small enough, this fraction is small enough. Uh, it means that the discharge is slow enough to uh, approximate the V out in that section with a line. And this is the equation for that line. Okay. Now, if I expand this fraction, I'm going to have VP minus VD on minus VP minus VD on divided by RL times T over C1. Okay. Now, what is T here in this situation? So, again, looking at this, we're, we're really talking about the, the T at the end of the discharge minus T at the beginning of the discharge. So, you can think of it that basically it's almost a full cycle. Right? Yeah, I know that it's like this much less than a full cycle. But again, if this discharge is slow enough, we know that, well, this is pretty close. This this, this section is actually pretty small because uh, we are not really discharging from the peak to a much, much uh, basically smaller voltage than the peak. We're not going from here to here or to close to zero or anything like that. We are going from 4.3 to maybe 4.2, 4.1, or 3.9, as mentioned in the previous slide. We are still pretty close to the peak, so we can say that this whole discharge happened happened over um, a full cycle of my sinusoidal, right? So based on this analysis, I can say that this T could be really replaced with 
capital T, which is the period of my input signal. So I'm going to call it Tn. So period of the uh, Vn, which is a sine AC signal. Okay, so you have a sinusoidal signal of one period of that sinusoidal, we're going to call it Tn. And we're going to say that this T, that is basically uh, the time that we have discharged, is almost equal to this period. Okay, so now looking at these two, this and this terms, uh, what I can see is that this is my initial value. So this is the 4.3. And this is how much I actually went down from that initial value, the second term. So this is really my VR, the ripple voltage. All right. So this is how much I actually got deviated from that 4.3, how much I did, how much my V out is decreased from 4.3. So if I just want to write VR, which is the ripple part, it's going to be VP minus VD on, same as before, divided by RL. And all I did was that I replaced T with this TN. Okay. One last thing is that I know that the period of a sinusoidal, so for an AC signal, or let's be more accurate, periodic AC signal, I know that F is equal to 1 over T. Frequency is 1 over period. So all I did is that I brought this T in to the denominator and I called it F in. Okay, so my ripple depends on all these parameters. So it's basically the amount of ripple that I have is really, uh, of course, clearly it depends on that 4.3 that I started with, right? So VP minus VD on. But more importantly, it depends on how big is the R, how big is the C, and how high is my frequency. So this is really telling me that if I want to make the ripple smaller and smaller, I have to make the resistor bigger. In a sense, think about it. If the resistor is really big, it, the, the, more I, uh, in, the, the, the more I increase the resistor, the smaller current I'm going to have here. Because if the voltage across the capacitor is, is constant, it's v, v is equal to IR, right? So when I increase the resistor and the voltage across the capacitor is that 4.3 that I try to actually make, the current is actually going down. When the current is going down, it means that the discharge rate of the capacitor is going down. Therefore, I'm going to have less ripple. Now, same with the capacitor. The bigger the capacitor, uh, the more charge it's going to store, right? So like I know that the bigger the capacitor, the slower it's going to discharge. It's like basically it has more capacity. We know that uh, Q of a capacitor is CV, right? So if the C is actually increased, it means that basically it doesn't matter, like, well, it does matter, but when I take more and more Q from the capacitor, the voltage is going to have less and less kind of, uh, basically it, the, the, the charges are going to have less and less impact on the voltage, right? So when Q is equal to CV, I can say from there that delta Q is going to have C delta V. So when I have a, uh, if I move, uh, I don't know, one coulombs of charge from the capacitor, the delta Q is going to, is going to be one coulombs. But then since C is actually increased, the delta V is going to be decreased. So the changes in the voltage, which is the, which is what we call ripple, is going to be decreased. Why increasing the the frequency is going to help? Again, intuitively looking at this, mathematically, it's it's clear from here, right? It's in the denominator, so increasing it is it's go, is going to help us. But intuitively, think about it, the higher frequency you have, the faster the sinusoidal is going up and down. So meaning that uh, we know that basically the ripple stops when the sinusoidal is back up, right? So imagine that if the sinusoidal went down here for a double the frequency, it would have come up back, come back up here, right? So you would have had this much ripple, right? So the discharge would have been stopped faster and sooner, let's say, right? So all these three are important. We're going to discuss them in the next slide. Okay, so we saw that in the previous slide, we saw that VR is equal to uh, the peak voltage minus VD on divided by RLC F input, right? Or C1 if we want to be consistent with the previous slide. Now the question is that how can I make these ripples smaller? And we talked about like the effect of 
C and R and Fn and well, the numerator, right? But let's actually think about the realist, the, the practicality of these solutions. The first thing was, well, we want to go with like basically larger resistors. Uh, so this should be larger resistor, right? So if I have a larger resistor, I'm going to have smaller um, ripple. But is that even controlled by me? Like, can I have a say in that? Not really, because remember, what does that resistor is really representing? It's representing the circuit that I'm connecting to. I'm connecting this, let's say that this DC that I created is to charge my cell phone. I'm not going to be controlling how much current is, is going to be drawn by my cell phone. My cell phone is going to draw a current uh, depending on whatever it wants to do. Like basically if you're running, if you're just basically charging your cell phone and your cell phone is basically you put it on the countertop and charging it, well, it's, not, it's going to draw some current. And then if you're actually charging it while you're making a phone call or like while you're actually using Skype and doing video chat, it's going to require more power. So it's going to draw more current, right? So the, the resistance that we're talking about really is not really controlled by us. It's controlled by the application. It's controlled by the circuit that we're connecting it to it. So if we are, as the designer, as the electronic designer, if you're designing a circuit to charge any cell phone with any situation, we should be okay with any kind of change in the resistance and still have a reasonable amount of ripple. We cannot really change the resistance. We cannot tell the circuit to have this resistance or that resistance. The circuit is going to draw some current from us and we're going to model that current with the resistor. Okay, so R is not really controlled by us, right? Uh, the other idea was to have closer peaks uh, of my, like basic, make sure that the input, ha the input voltage have closer peaks to each other, or me basically meaning that higher Fn, right? So if I increase the frequency, I know that instead of like, if this is F, I know that basically this is something like, I just have to make sure that I draw it right. So this is basically half cycle. So this is my 2F, right? This is another half cycle, so another full cycle here, right? So this is 2F, this is F, right? So if I have, if, if I double the frequency, um, I get to actually have less ripple, almost like half of the ripple, right? So again, is that controlled by us? Not really, because remember, uh, the sinusoidal input that is coming into our circuit is coming from the power lines. And the power lines all everywhere have a frequency of 60 Hertz. Of course, there are ways to actually do frequency conversion, but we don't want to get into that that kind of uh, uh, discussion at this point, right? Generally, whatever you design as an adapter is not supposed to be connected to some sort of a frequency converter before being connected to a power outlet. So you always have to kind of be working with 60 hertz or 50 hertz if you're in Europe or other places in the world. So at the end of the day, the frequency is not really controlled by us. So we should forget about like controlling frequency to get less ripples. Okay, so what is left? What is left is really the capacitor, right? So the capacitor is basically one thing that I can actually control it. If I make the capacitor larger, what happens is that I'm gonna have slower discharge and you can see the large C1, small C1, and very small C1. So if it's a very small C1, it's a disaster, right? So like it, it goes all the way, it quickly discharges, goes all the way back to zero. So you really don't have a DC, right? So a capacitor has to be larger than a certain value, but you can see that depending on how much capacitance you have, you might have this much ripple or this much ripple, right? So capacitor is one of those things that you can control and you indeed do control it to get less and less ripples. There is a caveat there, and then that is basically the size, the physical size. You don't want your, because capacitors are actually, once you actually make them larger than a certain amount, you're going to get larger and larger and larger capacitor, larger and larger physical size for this capacitor. Therefore, your adapter is going to get larger and larger, right? So the physical size is one of the limitations that we have to consider when we are thinking that, well, I'm just going to increase my capacitor to the infinity and then get really perfect like ripple free kind of a DC signal, right? So yes, capacitors are helpful. Increasing their size is helpful, but then we have to keep in mind that there's a limit to that. Anything else? Well, the 
last kind of a trick that we can pull to make these ripples small is to actually use the other half of our, our sinusoidal signal, right? Is there any way that somehow not only I rectify the positive half, I kind of flip the negative half and rectify it in this way so that I can actually basically decrease these ripples so that they can charge the capacitor again somewhere around here, right? So that's the idea of something that we call it a full wave rectifier, meaning that not only we are only, well, we are rectifying half of my waveform, I'm actually rectifying the other half. So I'm using the full potential of my waveform to create a DC signal. Okay, so that's the motivation. Let's talk about full wave rectifiers and how to make them.